Hello and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters podcast. I'm your host, Nigel Palmer, and I'm excited to bring you a Wildlife Matters introduction to British bats on this week's Wildlife Matters podcast. My fascination with bats began in childhood when I watched them gracefully flying around our garden. This childhood curiosity has blossomed into a lifelong passion. Even now, I eagerly anticipate the bats I might encounter on my evening walks. The introduction will provide a comprehensive overview with lots of information to capture your interest and I hope get you started on your own journey. We will follow up with more specific and detailed articles and podcasts on individual species for those of you who want to dive deeper into the world of bats. This week's Mindful Moments is truly magical and it's a first for us. But before we get to that, we have a lot to cover, much of it with some personal connections in this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News, which is coming up next on the Wildlife Matters podcast. Welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters and Nature News. And boy, have we got a lot of news for you today, so I better get cracking. First off, the Independent reports that the next stage of the mammoth public inquiry into the activities of undercover police began on Monday the 1st of July. Opening statements will be made over three days at the start of a series of hearings on the since disbanded secret Metropolitan Police Unit, the Special Demonstration Squad. During a crucial period between 1983 and 1992, the evidence will be heard in two stages from July to early August and then for several months starting in late September. A report following the first batch of hearings which examined the SDS between 1968 and 1982 found that the squad should have been shut down in its first years of existence. It said that of the groups spied upon during that period only three were legitimate targets. For over four decades, the SDS and a successor unit spied on hundreds of campaign and advocacy groups. During the 1980s and 90s, the SDS infiltrated groups, including the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, Troops Out and the Socialist Workers' Party, as well as many women's and animal rights groups. One of the undercover officers working at the time, Bob Lambert, was accused of planting a firebomb while undercover with an animal rights group that targeted branches of Debenham in the 1980s. And he fathered a child with a woman in an animal rights group who did not know he was an undercover police officer. The Metropolitan Police apologised and compensated Lambert's biological son in 2020. The inquiry will also hear evidence that the SDS used the identities of deceased children as cover without the permission of bereaved families during this period. It was back in 2015 when the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, set up the undercover policing inquiry after a public outcry over the actions of the unit's undercover officers. So far, the inquiry has cost over £82 million and its final report will not be published before the end of 2026. The inquiry still has a massive amount of information and evidence to examine, covering the SDS between 1993 and 2007 and its successor squad, the National Public Order Intelligence Unit. 
It then plans to examine other undercover policing activities before reviewing current practices and what should happen in the future. Wildlife Matters will keep you up to date with this. Now, it's been a difficult couple of months for the wildlife community based in the southeast of England. With the loss of two leading figures and founders of two of Surrey's main wildlife rescue centres. Simon Cowell, MBE, founder of the Wildlife Aid Foundation. Simon was a TV presenter and wildlife legend. He died on Sunday, June the 9th at the age of 72. In a statement, the Wildlife Aid Foundation said he dedicated his life to wildlife and worked to ensure countless injured and orphaned animals were given a second chance in the wild. His family said he was a passionate about the importance of environmental education and hopeful for a future in which man respects and protects the natural world. The Wildlife Aid Foundation will continue Simon's work and legacy from its Surrey base under the leadership of his daughter, Lou, who described her father as a sweary David Attenborough on local radio and said that his presence was in every single atom of the charity. Lou went on to say the support the family had received since his diagnosis was shared in 2022 was nothing short of overwhelming and just beautiful. The idea that everyone should do one action daily for nature underpinned Simon's dying wish to create a new home for his charity. The Wildlife Aid Centre is being developed and fundraising continues to deliver Simon's plans to open a visitor centre on a nearby new site. Wildlife Aid is asking for continued donations as part of its Simon's Last Wish campaign to continue his legacy. I had the pleasure of knowing Simon for over 20 years and working with him on several occasions. Always loud, sweary and good-humoured, he had an endless passion, energy and knowledge for helping wildlife and a clear love for all wild animals. Wildlife Aid thanked those who had sent messages of love and support since Simon's death and said this week in a statement that they had been moved and humbled by them. Adding that for those who wish to send flowers as a form of tribute, please consider sending wildflower seeds instead. They will then plant these at the new site in Simon's memory and in support of the local bees, insects and birds that he loved so much. We're also paying tribute to another wildlife legend that we've lost. Graham Cornick was the co-founder of the Hyder Style Wildlife Rescue and he died at the family home aged 80 in May. Graham and his wife Lynn set up the Hyder Style Wildlife Rescue in 1978 to help a deer injured in a road accident. The Cornick family described Graham as the genuine article who died peacefully at his home overlooking the wildlife hospital that he had created. Graham and Lynn's son, Orson, said, I would often say that my dad would care for any animal without caring whether it was ugly or beautiful. Each one got the same treatment and the same love. Graham and Lynn were awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award at the I4 Animal Welfare Action Awards back in 2021. And Orson paid a heartfelt tribute to his dad saying that his father had helped countless animals and influenced and supported and taught so many people. He continued, I cannot imagine a life without him or a world that doesn't contain his infectious silliness, warmth and love. My own memories of Graham are his compassion and kindness for all animals the extra special care he gave to every sick, injured or orphan wild animal I have ever taken to him. 
and the engaging and informative talks he gave to children and adults over so many years. It is comforting to know that Hyde Style and Wildlife Aid will continue to help wildlife in its hour of need under the guidance of family members. Please, if you can, donate to both rescues to support them and help Wildlife Aid move to its new home. Please donate directly to them via their own websites or fundraising pages. Thank you. And as we are recording today, we have heard that badger and wildlife legend Mick McCarrick, aka Mouse, has lost his brave battle with cancer. Mick was an ever-present in the anti-badger cult camps and patrols and helped save many badgers. He was a genuine, kind and funny man with a vast knowledge and experience of wildlife and a dedication and commitment that saw him give up days and weeks of his time and travel thousands of miles to help save badgers and to end the badger coals. I was privileged to meet Mick several times and work with him on patrols. I didn't know him outside of the badger world, but many friends and fellow advocates did, and their grief at his loss is palpable today. Rest in peace, Mouse. And that has been a personally very challenging Wildlife Matters Nature News. So what's the first thing you think about when someone talks about bats? Well, for some, it will evoke memories of horror movies and Count Dracula. For others... It may be the caped crusader, Batman and his psychic Robin, and many will react by stating that bats are creepy and get stuck in people's hair. Well, one thing is certain, bats are very misunderstood. Today, we stand up for our fellow mammals and want to change people's attitudes towards bats. So let's begin by speculating a little about the reasons we don't understand bats. Maybe it's because they are nocturnal and avoid bright lights and illuminated areas at night, which is the opposite of many of us, especially in urban and city areas. Now, bats are the only flying mammals in the UK, and they have a flight pattern distinct from birds. Their unique way of resting and eating bugs hanging upside down, makes them fascinating creatures to observe and learn about. Understanding these unique characteristics can help us appreciate their adaptability and their role within our ecosystems. Despite their unique lifestyle, bats share many similarities with humans. They are, of course, fellow mammals and they are all around us whether we live in a city centre, a town, or indeed a rural village. This shared environment should make us feel connected and responsible for their well-being. Bats are part of the order Chiropotera, which literally translates back to the ancient Greek meaning of hand wing. As we've said, they are the only mammals that can fly in Britain. We have a tremendous diversity of bat species here in Britain, with up to 18 species being recorded, depending on who you ask. Most are native. Some are recent new residents and a couple are seasonal visitors. However, the news about bat populations is not all positive. They have been declining over recent decades, primarily due to to human activities. But there is hope. Some species are showing signs of recovery. Now this should motivate us to take action and do more to protect and understand these fascinating creatures. If you do see bats, 
they will likely be one of the three pipistrelle species as they account for over 80% of the British bat population. As their name suggests, the common pipistrelle and its similar looking cousin, the soprano pipistrelle, are both doing well, whilst the Nathusius pipistrelle bat, Pipistrellus nathusii, was only considered as resident in Britain from 1997 and is still rare and confined to small areas of the country. The common pipistrelle is found throughout the UK. Pipistrelles are generalist feeders, consuming various insects such as moths, beetles and midges. They have adaptable roosting preferences and can be found in urban, suburban and rural environments. Its similar looking cousin, the soprano pipistrelles, prefer to feed in wetland areas and the best time to see both species is around dusk. Pipistrelles can be fairly easily identified by their distinctive twisting flight patterns. If you visit a pond, lake or slow flowing river in the early evening, you will most likely see pipistrelle bats searching for insects. All bat species in Britain are active from around April to November as they hibernate over winter. Bats have been recorded on warmer winter evenings, leaving their roosts searching for food and water as early as February. However, this is a high-risk strategy for them as the energy they use needs to be replaced by finding enough food. And if they don't find food, they are at risk of dying. Another bat you can see throughout Britain, including Scotland, although in much lower numbers than the pipistrelle species, is the Dorbentons bat, Myotis dorbentoni. Dorbentons will feed over slow flowing rivers or lakes, and they use their hairy feet to snatch insects hovering just above the water's surface in a high speed, super agile flying manoeuvre. If you see a flash of white belly fur, the chances are good that you have seen a Dorbenton bat feeding. The nocturnal bats are found throughout Britain. Nocturnal bats emerge at dusk and are interesting as they leave the roost flying upwards in a straight line. They feed on insects just above the tree line and look amazing when silhouetted against the evening sky. Serotine bats are one of the largest bat species in Britain. They can be seen in cities and towns, mostly around streets or buildings, as they hunt for moths and insects. They're also seen in urban parks and sometimes more extensive gardens, flying low over grass lawns as they take insects emerging from the grass. All the bat species I've mentioned so far are reliably seen throughout Britain. However, the picture becomes less clear as some bat species are regional whilst others have specific habitat needs not found throughout Britain. Whilst all British bat species use echolocation to navigate and find their food, the bat sounds are beyond our human hearing. So, if you want to see some of the other bat species, you should consider buying a bat detector. Now, bat detectors can be expensive, but a good quality detector can be found for around 80 to 120 pounds and will open you up to an amazing new audio world of bats. With a bat detector, you may be able to find the horseshoe species of bat. The more common, the lesser horseshoe bat, is still widespread throughout Britain. Whilst its physically bigger cousin, the greater horseshoe bat, is now restricted to the southwest of England and the south of Wales. Greater horseshoe bats feed almost exclusively on dung insects, such as flies and beetles, and rely on the dung of farmed or grazing animals. 
Between the 1960s and the 1990s, bat populations experienced a staggering decline of around 90%. Yes, 9 out of 10 of them. Now, this was primarily due to the increased use of ivermectin, a wormer in livestock and horses. These wormers, which remain in the environment even after the animal has passed the dung, have led to the death of the insects that the greater horseshoe bat relies on for its food. The decline underscores the urgent need for conservation efforts to protect these fascinating creatures. Both horseshoe bat species use their distinctive nose leaf to manipulate their echolocation call. So instead of the regular clicks on your bat detector, you will hear a high, almost warbling song that they emit. There are seven mouse-eared bat species in Britain, which all make very similar sounds. So you may want to go out with your local bat group to get some help to confidently identify the specific mouse-eared bat species. Local bat groups are crucial in monitoring bat populations, conducting research and raising awareness about bat conservation. By joining and supporting these groups, you can contribute to protecting and understanding these unique creatures. Using a bat detector, you may also find the brown long-eared bat. Their ears are two-thirds of the length of their body, so it's no surprise that they use echolocation to hunt their prey. Brown long-eared bats also have hushed calls, and that's because their favourite food is the yellow underwing moth, and that can detect echolocation at normal levels. So the brown long-eared bat has learnt to lower the volume of its calls. Evolution is fascinating. Ancient woodlands with mature trees are vital to some bat species, such as the barberstail and the Beckstein's bat. Both these species are now scarce and declining. We have an average of just 13% tree cover in Britain, where we were once the most wooded country within Europe, and only around 2 to 3% is considered as ancient woodland, which these species both need. In ancient woodlands, you will find incredible old oaks, beech, and new trees some of them several hundred years old. And these veteran trees are vital for many wildlife species, with the Barberstales and Becksteins relying on veteran trees for their roosts. Things like rot holes, splits or flaking bark make perfect homes for bats. Neither species will use trees that are near footpaths, roads, railway lines or any small woodland area that's highly managed, coppiced or over-tided, leaving these bats with very few options. Dramatic reductions in insect populations, the use of industrial pesticides and wormers and the loss of suitable habitat, in addition to development and light pollution, have all caused declines in bat species. It's fair to say that bats are having a tough time adapting to our modern lifestyle. It's also clear that the more specialised species are the most vulnerable, with nine of the 18 species of bat included in the first red list for Britain's mammals due to their rarity, rate of decline or lack of data. Like most mammal species, including humans, bats need certain things to thrive and survive. A safe place to rest and breed, or what we would call home, and access to food and water. If any of these are adversely affected, then populations will decline. There are many other factors in the decline of Britain's bat populations. The increase in new buildings and the removal of older buildings which had areas where bats could roost. 
the increase in light pollution in our villages, towns and cities, the decrease in insect populations, mainly due to the systemic use of pesticides on our crops, the routine medication of farm animals, reducing nature's dung collectors that some bat species rely upon, and the massive decline in hedgerows and wild flower meadows because of the needs of modern farming and its ever bigger machinery, and the use of wooden fence panels in our gardens rather than hedges, and the removal of gardens for additional car parking spaces. Now you might feel frustrated about what you can do to help Britain's bats. The good news is there are some key things we can all do that could really help them. Firstly, get gardening. Attracting more insects to an outside space will benefit bats. You can do this by planting some night flowering plants such as nicotiana, evening primrose and night scented stocks. These will attract moths and other night flying insects to your garden that the bats can then feed on. If you can, add a small pond or area of water. Even a small pond will help wildlife, including birds, mammals and, of course, bats. You should never use chemicals. Anything with the word side, such as pesticide or herbicides, means poison. It kills indiscriminately. Not just aphids or bugs, but everything from insects to larger mammals, including us. Many people are now falling seriously ill from poisoning from the glyphosate bug killers that are still legal and for sale in every garden centre and DIY shop in Britain. Complete madness. Another thing you can do is turn your lights off. The solar lights in your garden may look pretty, but not to bats and other animals with excellent nighttime vision. We have all heard that old saying, as blind as a bat. Well, guess what? It is entirely wrong. Bats have good eyesight in low light conditions, but they do not like bright artificial light. Surveys show that some bat species actively avoid areas with constant lighting at night, such as roads and airports. If you have ultra-bright security lighting, please aim the lights downwards so the beam is spread towards any possible intruders and not into the night sky where the bats may be trying to feed. And make your house bat-friendly. More needs to be done about bats roosting in houses and making new buildings more bat and wildlife friendly. To be clear, bats do not build nests or cause any structural damage with their roosts. The only likely damage from bats roosting in your loft is their urine, which can be mitigated relatively easily by covering the floor with dust sheets. Any items in the loft should be moved from directly under the roost and covered with more dust sheets. You should never use sticky insect or fly strips. Bats that get stuck will die a slow and painful death. And in our opinion, these horrific strips should be banned immediately. They are lethal for bats as they get stuck in them and die Bats will roost against roof beams, so please avoid using toxic wood treatments. Another death trap for bats in a house roost is modern breathable roofing membranes. The loose fibres can trap the bats, and once trapped, they will die from starvation. If you have bats in your house, you should know that all bat species in Britain are protected by law and that includes their roosting sites and resting places. The next thing to do is keep your cat in at night. Cats are the largest killers of bats in Britain. 
Keeping cats indoors at night, particularly around dawn and dusk when the bats emerge and return to their roosts, will help protect bats. Cats are highly skilled predators and have a massive impact on wildlife. In addition to bats, cats are also the largest killers of birds and mice in Britain. Very often, the cat does not kill the bat. It may be brought back to the house and then discarded. Please do not just put the bat outdoors. The high bacterial load in the cat's saliva will kill the bat slowly. The cat attack will also frequently split the bat's delicate wing membranes, meaning it can no longer fly. Wildlife Matters recommends that if your cat brings a bat home, you contact your nearest wildlife rescue and place the bat in a small box on a towel with a light cloth folded over the bat. This will make it feel less vulnerable. Then get it to the rescue centre as quickly as possible. The best way to learn about bats is to join your local bat group. The Bat Conservation Trust have groups all around the UK. Local groups will take you on bat walks, teach you how to use bat detectors, learn about the different species and how you can identify them. They also carry out bat surveys that provide data that the group will submit to the National Bat Monitoring Programme, helping inform future bat conservation and protecting bat habitats. These surveys are a fun way to spend time in nature and to help the Bat Conservation Trust understand more about bat species and the density of their population in your local area. This data will inform conservation efforts. In addition to protecting your local bats, it provides vital information for future conservation and protection, ultimately ensuring the survival of many bat species. And you can find your local bat group simply by visiting the Bat Conservation Trust website. Their website address is www.bats.org.uk. That's www.bats.org.uk. And that has been Wildlife Matters Introduction to British Bats. On this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments, I'm excited to bring you a first for us. Thanks to some techie-minded friends, we have found a way to deliver audio of a wild animal sound you may never have heard before. So sit back, relax and enjoy. have been listening to common pipistrelle bats recorded in the wild. Yeah, 
a truly magical, mindful moment that I am so pleased to share with you today on the Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. I was so excited to get the audio of common pipistrelle bats and find that the tech recording equipment could make it audible to our human hearing levels. I like to push boundaries and aim to do so as much as possible on the Wildlife Matters podcast. And with this episode, we've reached a significant milestone. Yes, episode 60 since our journey began at the end of 2021. We've also had the pleasure of five episodes now go over 10,000 downloads each. And this wouldn't have been possible without your amazing support. Thank you for being part of the Wildlife Matters community. And we always like to hear where you listen to us. So drop us an email or comment on this week's social media post asking you that very question. We do read every answer and comment and reply to as many as possible. And don't forget, you can now listen to us and see some shorts videos on the Wildlife Matters YouTube channel. Please give us a like and a subscribe when you get there. Wildlife Matters will return in two weeks. Until then, get outside, enjoy wildlife and nature, and always keep it wild. I've been your host, Nigel Palmer, and this is Wildlife Matters signing off.